Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. Hello, travel hackers. Today's featured guest is Gio Ramirez from Hello Points Bro. Gio is a first generation Filipino American, born and raised in the Bay Area, and currently residing in San Antonio, Texas. He has run more than 25 marathons and has taken part in some incredibly creative ways to generate side hustle income and points and miles, including being a test subject in clinical trials. In today's episode, Gio and I discussed how to get out of trouble with collections if you find yourself in that situation. And how exactly does payment, miles and points, or pretty much anything else logistically work when you're a clinical trial test subject for days or weeks at a time? Enjoy! Hey Gio, welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. We are so excited to have you here today. Hey Julia, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Of course. So before we jump into all of your miles and points strategies and everything, Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the game of points and miles. Oh, okay. So I'm Gio. I'm 32 years old. I live in San Antonio, Texas. The way I got in miles and points, I had a credit card in college the first time I went. And uh, that I went into collection. So I never really got to do the points until 2014 when I fixed my credit up and then I got the freedom, freedom and discover it at the same time. So like two of the same almost credit cards, but cash back. And I didn't really know about chase points. I just freedom was for me, was a cash back card. And then 2016, my brother told me about the Amex platinum. There's like some offer. It was a hundred thousand Amex points to sign up. And he said I should try to do it. And I had no idea about points and miles at that moment. But he was already taking trips to Europe and stuff. And I I thought that was really cool. So I applied and I got approved. So that was really my first foray into points and miles. And then shortly after, I got the Sapphire. That's still a lot of credit cards. So let's let's back up a little bit. When you were sent to collections, what's some advice that you have for anybody who might be sitting here right now being like, my credit score isn't good enough to get all of these cool travel hacking credit cards. How does one get out of collections or fix your credit as fast as possible afterwards? That is a good question. Um, I actually know a couple of my friends that paid for uh, credit repair, but really like all the stuff that they do, you could do yourself. I understand like people trying to collect money is not the most pleasant thing, but uh, basically what you need to do is see what is affecting your credit score. So go on credit karma, see if what it is, late payments, uh, collection accounts, and then just be organized, like know what, what is, what is there, what you need to fix. And then anything on there, um, actually uh, for COVID, the first few months, because some of these collection companies were like closed because of COVID, you could have just disputed everything and a lot of this stuff was dropping off. So like I had like got a lot of my, get all my, a lot of my information from Reddit, churning subreddit and award travel, churning for the earning, award travel for the redemption. But yeah, basically you just need to, you just need to, uh, dispute everything at first and see what like still sticks because like I mean it's free like you dispute it and then sometimes it drops off sometimes it doesn't but you have to do it for every credit bureau and some collections are only one or like are all, all three or so that's a start and then it whatever is left honestly it's a seven year thing so like the the older it gets the the less it impacts you, but it's still going to impact you like a good amount until it drops off after seven. So if it's sent to collections, dispute everything, 
Hopefully some of it will drop off. And then for anything that sticks, just pay it off and eventually your credit will get fixed if you just have good behavior. Is that the general process? Um, so yeah, that's another thing. Like just because you pay a collection off doesn't mean it really is going to make that big of a difference. So like, I think it helps your score a little bit. To, and then also when people bring up your credit history, they can see that this is a derogatory account that you paid in full. But like a lot of these collection companies will do like pay for delete. So like basically you want to make sure if you pay it off that they're going to take it, take it completely off your credit. And on, I don't have a uh, history of too many collection companies. I know they're all different. Some of them are going to say, no, we don't do that. Or like, they'll be like, yeah, settle for less than the amount. And then we will take it off. But what you kind of want to do is once you call the collections company, you want to uh, try to get something in writing before you pay it all off or something. Cause like, I mean, they can tell you one thing you pay it. And then they're like, no, we'll just, we're just putting it on here that, you uh it's settled for full or whatever but if it's a if it's an old one say it's like five years old like it does it doesn't really make sense to pay it off because in two years it's going to drop off anyway so like it, it it just depends on your situation maybe if it's like two years old then you pay it it helps a little bit if they don't take it off but yeah if it's an older one i would just i would just run this up makes sense so how long did it take to to get everything from like collections phase to travel hacking phase for you? So like, yeah, 2009, 2010, I had like three credit cards in collections, uh, like a medical bill, but th they weren't high limits. So like a thousand, seven hundred fifty. I wasn't really like concentrated on fixing my credit. I just knew I had to like eventually pay it off so I kind of just stumbled around for a few years and then so that's like four years 2014 is when I got real bank cards again but if you really try like honestly you could you could do it faster especially if they the paper delete but um some of the banks if you get their their any account um, into collections they're not going to lend to you or it's going to take a while so like one of the banks that capital one where my card went into collections actually uh, in 2015 or something. They they accepted me again, but Barclays, they denied me for the longest time. And then I just recently got one of their cards again, which was, was like now 10 years later, finally. Like, <laughs> finally, I'm back on their good graces. So some of these credit card companies, they hold a grudge for a while. Oh, yeah. Like you don't. It, it, it just sucks because, like, say you started with, like, a, a Chase or American Express. I know they're kind of strict to, like, accept people back. Um, I think Capital One is probably the easiest, but they pull all three credit bureaus every time. So that's annoying. Yeah. So you said you now have 24 cards, previously 26. So when you started applying for these, were you applying for them in batches or how does this go for you? Yeah, that's, that's actually what I did before, but that, that got me in trouble this time around. So like, uh, in 2014, I don't think these, some of these banks didn't have like their own, you know, like if you have an American, Exp like, I think it's free, even if you don't have American Express or Capital One Chase, they have their own, I think it's Vantage. Well, they might give you, a, I'm not sure if it's Vantage or FICO score, but they have their own like credit monitoring. This time around, I, I got out of Chase jail recently. I applied for one of their cards and then like the next day I applied for like two different ones. And I think that's what got me in trouble with Capital One because like they had, I don't know, like I'm, I'm sure like lending tightened. And then so like it, you get flagged now if you apply for too much credit, like too soon. And then uh, they went through my accounts and then they banned me. So <laughs> I probably wouldn't do it in batches anymore, to be honest. Like, I don't know exactly how long you should wait, but like, I don't think that's a good idea. That makes sense. I would generally recommend to people wait at least 30 days, maybe, but maybe up to 45 between different card applications, unless you want to really try to blitz it, but it's not sustainable to do that. Like you said, credit card companies can get mad if you do that too often. Actually, when, 
there was this thing for like city American airlines for the longest time. People would like just keep applying for their cards. Uh, they would get mailers. Basically they'd sign up for American airlines loyalty rewards under like random different names, like their dog's name and whatever, whatever. And then have it sent to their, cause once you sign up, then you're offered, you're offered the credit card. So they'd have like a bunch of mailers and then they would just keep applying for city American airlines cards. <laughs> So like I don't know I think on Reddit there's like probably some dude is like yeah I've I've done this like twenty times I'm like oh. and he would just I, I, keep transferring American Airlines miles into his main account after being like I am Gio Ramirez forty three I am Gio Ramirez forty four like they would all go to the same account eventually so I think you just book what did I do you just book the you just book the travel. I don't think it's actually, it was actually this, cause it's different, man. I did this. I just don't remember how that, how it worked. I, I, I got like the card like five times, but I didn't do it like every week. I just did it spread across like probably a year or slowly, but surely, um, dying, dying. So what are some other different games or techniques that you had back in the day that no longer work back in the day was like, Six weeks ago, but yeah, I used to do the Walmart, Walmart thing. That doesn't Everyone work. Did the Walmart thing? No, no, no. So it it was MetaBank card, and yeah, you would just go to Walmart and basically just use the debit card to like get a money order. Um, but you already saw that coming. So like before, there was like no limit on how much you could buy, and then they limited you, and then they started taking your ID. So then it was like 2000 a day, but since I kept doing 2000, like once they sweat. And that's another thing. So like I get it with the money orders, but like for MoneyGram, I can't do anything with MoneyGram anymore because I'm like flagged as fraud. So like I try to send somebody MoneyGram, like, like just regular, like to send them money. And they're like, sir, like you, it's on on my screen. It says this is like suspicious activity slash fraud. Like, oh man, you guys like, come on. Like, that's not cool. So um yeah I'm, I'm banned from moneygram also but man but, um, you got banned from a lot yeah, of things i know slowly but surely bans everywhere uh and then you used to be able to buy buy um money orders from from the post office which actually you still i have to try the, the different banks but it would be vanilla the vanilla cards and then that died pretty pretty quick like after i got into it yeah so since all your manufacturer spending techniques are slowly but surely dying, um, what's your? I plan? have like I have zero right now. <laughs> I I need I'm, I need to do a little bit more more work because they're out there. It's just you need to find that find them. People aren't just going to give away secrets, so they're they're out there. You just you just need to find them. There's a lot a lot of gems in there for like mostly what not to do. So there's a lot of gems in there for what not to do. Let's talk a little bit about what you do do from day to day. What's your main way of getting a lot of points and miles legitimately, either through day job, normal spending? What's your best advice for getting a lot of points and miles just day to day? Man, the the whole day to day crime, like I'm a part of that now. Like I didn't really pay attention before, unless it was for like a meeting minimum spend. But right now, I do Uber, so some of the, the non-partner restaurants, I could use my own credit card. If I go to dinner with my parents, like I could use my credit card, and they're just super nice, so they'll just pay. I've heard of buying groups. I haven't got into that. Um, that's where you, I guess, buy stuff for other people, and then they sell it or something to give you money. Day to day. Yeah, that's really it. Uh, I have recurring charges. I make sure it's on the right card. I just, I could pay my insurance in full and use PayPal. What do you do in your day job and or side gigs? Yeah, so I don't have like a like a traditional uh, job. I graduated with a degree in chemistry from UTSA, but I haven't actually used it yet. I'm on a little little break before I start my professional life, so. Right now, the the main thing I do, or the most most of my money comes from I do clinical trials, like as a subject, uh, phase one. So basically, I take I take medication. Uh, they take my blood a lot. They do a lot of vitals and ECG and stuff. And then 
they pay me at the end. And it's like a stay. You have to stay there for a few days. Sometimes it's a few days. Sometimes it's a month. I think the longest one I've done is 30 days. But there was actually recently one for like three and a half months. I was like really wanting to get in. But like I'm too brown for it. They, they, want, they needed white people. So I couldn't qualify. But yeah, that paid a lot of money. So I could have just done that and not done anything the rest of the year. So sad. But yeah, clinical trials. Uh, I do Uber, Uber Eats, Lyft, and Grubhub in between trials. What were they testing that they only wanted Caucasian subjects? This one particularly, it was for, I think it's like a sunburn skin patch. Like they they put a patch on your skin and then you, they have to see, yeah, you can't have back hair either or like it has to be consistent because they have two, they had two spots where they would apply the thing and then you had to like burn easily or whatever. And yeah, it was three and a half months, but it, it paid $56,000. So like pretty good, all, all meals included. <laughs> that makes sense why they would want people who don't have a lot of melanin for this trial. Do you get some kind of points and miles for doing this? Do they put you up in a cheap hotel and you get all of the eligible nights or anything like that? How does that piece work? Yeah, the whole, uh, recently since Corona, they've been doing stuff like that. Um, not anymore, but, uh, initially like some of the places would put you up in a hotel until you get your COVID test results back. They pay you for, they'll pay you a little extra for travel. But now, even though, you know, COVID is like coming back, it's, they got kind of got rid of that. So, um, you can always like add it as a business expense, but like, I don't, I need like $11,000 of things to itemize. and I'm not really close, close to that. <laughs> so you need $11,000 of revenue in order to itemize or expenses. Uh, right. Expenses. Isn't like the deduction, like 11,000 or something. Right. It used to be like six and then now it's doubled. I don't know. I could just be completely wrong, but like, yep. So I'll just take the standard deduction unless I do some crazy stuff for for trials. But yeah, you could do like your mileage if you drive or flying in a hotel, meal. That's cool though. So do you just get to log clinical trials as a side business or how do you log that? And then you can itemize travel and all of these other expenses, maybe get some eligible nights if you're staying in a hotel for a clinical trial. How does all of that work? Yeah, so I should probably have a tax person do it. I just do it um, myself. I, I know, like, if you say you're going to, you think you're going to, you're going to use or have this income, like, next year and the year after, that it's taxed differently. So, like, but for me, like, even though I, I've done this, like, a couple years, I expect to do it next year and the year after, I, you never know, like, for, like eat it for your health and stuff. Like you have to be healthy. Like you don't know if you're going to be healthy next year. Like God willing, you are. But so like I can't say 100 percent. Like oh yeah, I expect to have this income or whatever. But um, I, I haven't itemized my stuff. So uh, mainly because that whole standard deduction thing. Like I thought, or I don't think I could itemize that many things. But maybe this year I'll just be doing more trials and traveling more. So I'll hit that. It's a cool way to get some side income for somebody who's remote, independent, and wants to get some money this way by just getting into clinical trials, traveling around, getting to write off some expenses that way. It's a cool gig. I I really do like it. And like when I'm in the trials, I'm always just like looking at places I want to go. Like my last trial I was in, it was in Dallas or like in Austin, and it was like 24 nights. And then that's where I planned Jamaica. And then like, yeah, I just recently went to Jamaica. So, and then when I got out, like a few days later, I, I flew out of DFW, Montego Bay. Nice. Speaking of, what are some of your favorite travel hacking redemption stories? Was it Jamaica or was it something else where you were able to get a pretty sweet redemption using your points and miles? My favorite was, I, I, I have a couple, I guess there's a couple favorite ones. So like my first, my first, um, what's it, sign up bonus, or maybe it was my second, because it was my uh, Sapphire card. Uh, I used my points on Southwest to take my parents and I, 
like me and my parents to Seattle, round trip us three there and back. And I had a few points left over. So that was really cool because I got to like take my parents somewhere. And then the hotel uh, stay, I used Hilton points for all five nights we were there. Although like we stayed kind of by SeaTac and we should have stayed downtown Seattle, but it's okay. I didn't have enough points for downtown Seattle. But it's still nice. They have a little tram, like train downtown. So that was a nice one. Um, more recently, I did uh, Singapore Suites. I did uh, Singapore to Sydney in March, right before everything closed down. So that was cool. I got like, I think it was me, me and another person. That was the only people in first class. But it was like the older, older first class. Uh, so not the room with the rolly chair or whatever, but like the enclosed like seat. And then, oh man, they just treat you like, like a king and stuff. And like, I, I love it. So it was, I think 84,000, 84,000 Singapore miles and like 80 or 90 Singapore dollars or something like that. And yeah, that, that was another experience. Like the, they have a first class lounge. You go, I didn't know, I should have like looked more into it, but. They have a first class lounge and then they have a first class um, fine dining experience before you even get on the plane. So like you're there and then they're just pouring you champagne and I have like lobster tails. And I'm like, this is after I had already eaten on the way to the airport chili crab. So I was like really full, but like I had to get it. Um, yeah. So that was a good one. This is just in the airport lounge? Yeah, it, it's a uh, Singapore airport or Singapore air airport first class lounge in Singapore. So like top, top dog stuff. Like they have the first class lounge and then they have like a different lounge for like the sweet, the sweet people that like have sweets. And uh, so, yeah, that was an incredible experience. I love Singapore airport and we didn't even go into the lounges. I think we had just priority pass or something, but there was so much to do even outside of the lounges. I got, like a free Dior facial that you can just go up and then they'll give you a free facial. I went to La Prairie and they had like the $600 jar of white caviar face cream that they, they just gave me free samples and you can sample like fancy anything in Singapore airport. They had cognac, champagne, some gray goose martini stuff. They were just giving out free drinks at all of these places and all of the makeup samples. They have a free movie theater. I don't remember if the swimming pool is free or not. We didn't go swimming, but, and the food court's just really good too for $5. But yeah, if you can get into the first class lounges, that must be a whole nother world of luxury. Yeah. I kind of wish I, I went, I mean, I'm going to go back sometime, but like when I was there, the airport was like very empty. It was like really sad because I mean, that was first week of March uh, already. It was like, there was like no one there, but there's a lot of stuff to look at. I honestly just tried to find the lounge and I went there, but I was just passing all sorts of stores, like designer stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is like a mall. Oh, it's all of Singapore is like a mall sometimes. Well, certain pieces of Singapore are very much just like a mall with all of the luxury goods. And you said you use just the regular Chris Fire miles from these. Did you just transfer it from your Chase account or what cards did you use in order to get this redemption? Yeah, I had to finesse this a little bit, and that's what's nice about having the multiple bank currencies. I did Amer member American Express membership rewards and City thank you points for that one. And I think I had to sign up the Premier, like City Premier is like a really good card. Like they always have like sixty thousand points on up. So like so, I mean, it, uh, if anyone hasn't done City points yet, like you got. You need to get on it because like they have some good stuff. I think two or four years, two or four it might be four years. Like you could get only get it once every four years. Before it wasn't like that, so you could just sign up for whatever you wanted. But now they put the put that in. See, like every little thing now, like stopping people from like abusing stuff like that. But um, yeah. So thank you points and membership for like points. What are some of the sweet spots for the city thank you points? Because I think that's probably the least known out of the three families between Chase and American Express and city points. What are some of the sweet spots that you've been able to get with those points? Honestly, I don't really, I'm not too familiar with it either. Like that was 
uh, redemption I had. What else have I used City for? Like, I think they used to be, didn't they used to be Hilton too? Maybe. I don't know. I think they used to have a Hilton card. Maybe not. I'm just wrong. I think I've used their travel portal because it's the same thing. You get bonus, like, like the Sapphire, you get like the 25% bonus, I think. Um, but I'm actually setting up my city points. I want to do Emirates first class. So I have like 100,000 city points right now. I'm going to do DFW to Dubai uh, first class. I think hopefully sometime next year. And that's like 140,000. 140, Is that one way? Uh, for a while. Oh, uh, yeah, one way, <laughs> unfortunately. I know, it's so expensive. Like, uh but I mean, the flight itself is like, for if you're going to pay cash, and I know people are like, would you ever spend 14000 No, I don't know. Well, obviously, no for me, but it's just it's just a cool thing. My flight's $14,000. So. Nice. I have not been to Dubai, but so many people on this podcast have said that Dubai is the best place that they've ever been to, and that Emirates is one of the best experiences that they've had as far as flight products go. So I look forward to seeing that and hopefully one day experiencing it as well. Yeah, I heard the two big ones are well, Emirates and then um, Emirates and uh, sorry, uh, Idiad. Emirates and Idiad are like the top dogs, and like, and then Singapore is like close, but the Middle East ones like beat beat out the Asian ones. Q Suites, Qatar Airways. Yeah. Cool. Too fancy. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's your next travel hacking moves that you're gonna make? I was supposed to do an Instagram meetup. But I might pick it, be left behind there. As of right now, I don't have anything planned until March. Uh, I have Bora Bora, so that should be fun. What by myself? What points? What cards do you use for Bora Bora? I want to hear about this. Right. So um, I think for the my first platinum airline credit, I did at the United Gift Registry, and I have haven't used it. That was like 2016. So I have I've used it like. Sixty dollars of it, so I had one hundred and forty. I used the United, so I used that credit for plus, like I think it cost another hundred dollars on top for uh, San Francisco to uh, PPT, PTT, like the main airport for uh, French Polynesia. And then on the way back, I bought, I had to buy a ticket from French B, but I think it was only like two hundred bucks. It was really cheap, so that was cash um, to get to San Francisco. Uh, I'm doing Southwest Point, and then I'm going to stay the night there because there's no, like, the time zone. So I'm going to stay at Hyatt. I'm going to use 12,000 points to stay at the, I think it's Hyatt Regency SFO. Maybe. And then while I'm there, uh, so th- it took a while. This is it was hard to find availability for Hilton because, like, they, you have Hilton, a bunch of people have Hilton free night certificates, but they're only good for, uh, standard room. So if you're looking um, for a standard room in a spot that everyone keeps booking standard rooms, it's kind of hard, but I was able to find availability for that. So I have two nights. I'm going to do two nights on um, points certificates. One of the nights I'm paying, it's $400 with the taxes and everything. It's like 420 30 And then you need to take like a boat from the air, air from the airport to the resort. So that's going to cost money. That's going to be straight out, like just out of my pocket. It's, it's probably like hundred bucks or something. And then, um, on another night. Oh, and you need to take, <laughs> you need to take a flight from PPT or puppy to Bora Bora. So that round trip, it's like a 45 minute flight is like round trip. is like $400 and that's going to come out of my pocket. I don't, I had capital one, capital one credits or whatever. But it just got credited credited to my account when they closed my account, so that's just going to be cash. Um, and then I'm going to so I'm going to stay at the uh, the Bora Bora uh, Hilton Bora Bora is it Conrad for three nights, and then and I have a diamond, and I've never honestly gotten anything with diamond Hilton, so we'll see if like they'll give me something this time. I know you get free breakfast, and that's a lot at like a like a resort where you just have to buy everything there. So uh, that, and then I'm going to check out the uh, St. Regis for one night. It's 85,000 points. And I actually just got 60,000 points for renewing my 
Bonvoy Brilliant. I was going to close it. And then they offered me 60000 just to keep it open. I was like, bet. What did you have to ask them in order to get the retention offer? So I asked twice because like I really was going to close it. And then I just wanted to see what it was. And this was like maybe a month before my annual fee hit. And she was like, the representative was like, no. And then so I called my annual fee hit and I called probably like two weeks later because I was really going to close it because I have too many, like too many, but I have like what, three or four cars that the annual fees are like 400 plus. So like that's already, you're spending 2000 Like it doesn't even matter if you get full value, but you're, you're spending $2,000 off the bat. Like that's a good amount of money. So I was, And it's like overlapping stuff. So like all of them have priority pass. I don't need priority pass for time. Um, and the second time I called, I was just like, can you check if I have retention offers? Like just fully expecting they would say no. And then the guy was like, oh, actually it's 60000 I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, that's totally, I, it's worth it either way, but that, that one really like made me keep it another year. Cause like 60,000, the credit, the, the Bonvoy credit, the free night, like already that right there, like solid. So I have had no luck with chase cards and retention offers. Amex Platinum gave me a retention offer for mine, but with chase, I'm like, can you check for all of my cards? And I've checked. <laughs> Ink Business Preferred, my Hyatt card, my IHG card. I mean, three of my cards don't have annual fees, but of the four out of seven cards that I have with Chase, uh, busted on all of them. No retention offers. It was a sad day. So I'll try with my husband. I've, I've never tried with Chase. Yeah, I've never tried with Chase. Like, I should. I don't know why I haven't. I just haven't. Because your Marriott was with Amex. Yeah, my Marriott was Amex. Yep. Yep. Out of my eight attempts, I guess, I, I guess we'll call it five attempts, Amex has been the one that worked for me. So that's good to know for everybody. Um, yeah. And then you can just call them up and ask, hey, any retention offers? Tip for anybody listening, don't actually call them and say, I want to close down my card. Because if you don't want to close down your card and you just want a retention offer and then your agent says, okay, cool, your account's closed now. That's a sad day. So don't bluff by doing that. Be like, help me out. You want my business? I want to stay. What can you give me? Yeah, just keep, just, just be like, hey, um, I'm trying to make up my mind if I want to keep this card or not. Is there anything that you have that can convince me to keep the card? And if they say no, just say, okay, thanks. I'll keep, I'll keep thinking it over. And then don't actually cancel the card right there. Yeah, I've tried with City a few times and I haven't gotten anything with them. Amex is really the only one. I think I've gotten like one other. So with all of the travel hacking knowledge that you've gotten over the years, both good and bad from things that you should be doing and should not be doing, what is the number one piece of advice that you have for listeners today? It's really easy to be impulsive with signing up with credit cards. Like there's a rush you get from like waiting, submitting, waiting, submitting. And I totally understand that. You see like an amount of points, you're like in your computer screen, you're like, let's do this. But yeah, like you want to put a little bit more research into that. Recently, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, I should take my own advice. I just got the, uh, the aviator, the Barclays aviator. Cause I was just like, Oh, I'll see if Barclays accepts me. And I get, I got it, but I got it uh, like a regular app, like on the, on an American flight, you can get the, the annual fee waived for the first year. So you save $95. So like already there, it's like, I was impulsive. I wanted to see if Barclays would accept me. I should have waited or looked quick Google search, like what it said, they give you a code, you apply, and then you waive the annual fee. So like do a little bit of research before you apply for credit cards. And um, that's my main advice. Cool. And speaking of good advice, can you give a travel hacking shout out to somebody on the internet who you think other people should follow as well because they have really great travel hacking advice? It's going to be Kelly F. F. The Joneses because like she has some travel hacking, but it's also like some other stuff. So her, her content never gets old and she has a good personality and it's just really fun to follow her story. Cool. And where can we find you on the internet? A lot of places actually, but my Instagram is uh, handle is hella underscore points underscore bro. 
And I'm just so happy I got that handle because that's just like straight fire. But yep, check me out there. Um, I just post some random stuff about credit cards and places I go. Let's like add me and we'll be friends. When you say we can find you in a lot of other places, do you have a blog or something else that we should be following? YouTube? Uh, mm, I have Facebook. Um, I have some of my track and field times and then, you know, some random pictures online of me. So you could check it out if you like. This sounds really intriguing. And I feel like people should just Google you now to be like, what am I going to find? I have a unique name too. So Google loves me. Giorgio Ramirez. Giorgio Ramirez. My dad, like, Armani. So actually my middle name's Armand. So na- my name is Giorgio Armand Ramirez. That's amazing. He was gonna name me Gucci, but or Prada, but he decided Giorgio is better. So here I am. If you were born a girl, would you have been named Prada or Chanel? Uh- actually I met a Chanel. Yo, shout out to Chanel in Jamaica, girl. What's up? I hope you're listening to this because yeah, I met her at the Hyatt. What's up, girl? That was the best shout out I think we've had on this show so far. Fine. Fine. Nope. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was really useful. Um, we learned so much today about collections and clinical trials, a little bit about manufacturer spending, things that you should and should not be doing for your New Year's resolutions of whatever you want to be accomplishing with points and miles this year. So thanks so much, Gio, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards or other tools mentioned on today's call piqued your interest, please use the links in the show notes to apply or to learn more about any of the cards. Commissions earned from these signups help to support the podcast. Additionally, the single best travel hack I can recommend is finding friends who can show you about even more travel hacks, and it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend. And if you would like to meet even more travel hacking friends, come join one of our travel hanging hangouts. We discuss behind the scenes tips, celebrate each other's wins, and mostly just enjoy being around other people who enjoy this hobby just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, just head over to geobreeztravel.com hangouts and sign up to be on the invite list. See you there. Take care and happy travels.